afternoon and welcome. Welcome to our second Global Studies Happy Hour. Our first one was on Tuesday and we had a wonderful conversation about Fulbright and the Fulbright program with Sofian. It was outstanding. I got a lot of positive feedback from that one. And so this week is our only week where we will have two happy hours. <laughs> Um, the rest of our happy hours will continue to be on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. So we so appreciate you joining. And um, so this time we are on Zoom. Last time we, we tried Google Hangout. And I apologize. I found out later that Google Hangout only allowed for 20 people. And so I got emails from eight or 10 people who were trying to join as well, and their access was denied. Um, so um, the only issue with Zoom is that we are limited to 40 minutes. So we're going we're gonna to have to wind up by 2.40. So just to let everybody know, so we're going to jump in. And today's topic, uh, Sarah Akumi and I are presenting on capitalizing on your study abroad experience. And we're gonna be talking about um, how to take your study abroad experience and talk about it and write about it in meaningful ways to translate those experiences um, to prospective employers. Yes, ma'am. And so with that, hold on. And you guys, see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. I will let Sarah kick us off. Well, it's so great to have everybody here. And um, this topic was just thought of just because a lot of students who go abroad or who are thinking of coming abroad seeing the experience is just not a trip, but how to make themselves marketable while studying abroad. Mm -hmm. And so being able to articulate how your study abroad experience is going to benefit your next employer or graduate school or um, any other field you're trying to get into is very important. And actually seeing how to make those connections, no matter what field you're working in, is important as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're here to discuss. So one of the keys we're really going to talk about and drive home is transferable skills. So this is that idea that you are learning a lot of things on the ground uh, when you study abroad um, and you're going to have a lot of skills that you accumulate that translate into other places. So it translates into um, what kind of student you are, what kind of employee you are, um, and some of those skills we thought we'd go through. Um, and those of you who have studied abroad and have, you know, um, some lived experience with some of these skills, we welcome you to chime in and, and talk about those and tell a story. But some of those um, that Sarah and I discussed included um, leadership is so important, of course. Um, adaptability and flexibility. So um, we know that being in a, a study abroad situation, um, things don't always go as planned. <laughs> uh, your your timetable, I know um, just an example, when I was um, in Senegal working on my master's thesis research, um, I would set times and have all these ideas of when I wanted to do stuff and all of these sort of rigid ideas. And you learn really quickly that doesn't fly. So you have to be adaptable and flexible and go with the flow and meet when people can meet and um, not be so rigid about um, doing things a particular way. Um, Cross-cultural communication, anytime we go to a different place um, and we're learning about, um, and this, this partners well uh, with foreign language proficiency as, as well, 
um, there is nothing like uh, being thrown in the deep end, so to speak, and see how your foreign language skills fare. Um, I think it's such a great experience. Um, um, I know when I was when I was in Senegal, for example, um, my French grew uh, in leaps and bounds. Uh, there were definite days that I wanted to uh, dig a hole and and crawl in it because <laughs> uh, it's you know it's frustrating when you're used to um, being able to communicate at a certain level and all of a sudden you feel like you're talking like a child. Um, but yeah, that that um, that growth there. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk about the second half? That would be good. And so corporation, and I see that as how you are just getting along with um, each other and different mm -hmm. individuals. And for example, you don't know who, if you stay with a host family, you don't know who that will be or um, who your brothers or sisters may be in that household. So learning those people skills and those interpersonal skills actually come to effect. And so you realize, do I actually have them? Have I actually learned what I'm doing? Do I know how to get along with other individuals who may not speak the same language that I have or who may be different from me? And that can also lead into problem solving. Different problems will arise. It's impossible to go on a study abroad trip and a problem not arise. But how you solve that problem is important. And so panicking is probably not the best way to handle the situation. But taking that deep breath and figuring out, well, maybe I've lost my luggage. It's okay. I know that I have my carry-on with other luggage and a whole two outfits for two days. And so just having those problem-solving <laughs> skills and being ready is important as well. And studying abroad always comes with taking courses. Um, and that time management, you learn that now. But being abroad, especially the time difference and when you fly in, and figuring out how am I managing my class schedule? How am I managing my time? How do I talk to my family in a different time zone? Mm -hmm. So you're really being put to the test with your time management skills and understanding your weaknesses and your strengths. And also conflict management and interpersonal skills as well. And you don't know who you might um, interact with or people with different beliefs and ideals than yourself and being in a different um, country and understanding how to be um, empathetic and tolerant of other people's views and also understanding if a conflict arises, even let's say you're doing a, a class project, how to handle that in a professional manner as well. Mm -hmm. And persistence, you know, keep going on. Um, you may get homesick in the first week or you mm -hmm. might, homesickness might hit in the middle of your study abroad journey. And so understanding that, hey, I came here for a reason and reminding yourself let me keep moving on I can do this I'm here I'm okay and just understanding how to encourage yourself and with that discipline also I mean going abroad can be super nice a place you go to can be a vacation spot but setting that discipline and a schedule and understanding how you're going to do your courses how you're going to have time for yourself to have self-care and understanding all of that and keeping organized will help with that discipline yeah, so I think it's important, we were talking as we were looking through this list, um, how, many of, how many of these things we use day in, day out. Most of us who are in, uh, who are employed, <laughs> um, have to uh, know how to work in teams. We have to know how to problem solve. You know, when you get hit with a problem, um, you know, you um, have to dive in and work that problem. And, you know, how much employees, appre employers appreciate discipline and persistence and people who have um, solid critical thinking skills and uh, people who are adaptable and flexible. So all of these things um, we think that are, that are gained through study abroad have a lot of positive implications um, as we think about um, translating that into getting a job. Identifying skills. So just understanding your skills. Sometimes 
as students or even individuals, we don't see our skills that we have, we think, oh, it's just something I do. And you don't see how important it is to identify the different skills you have and to be able to speak on them. And so even when you're working in a class project um, with people from different cultural backgrounds, you can do that even in your home institution, but especially when you're abroad, that goes back to those transferable skills. So identifying, oh, I do have good interpersonal skills. I am able to problem solve. I am able to just get in there and be flexible and ready to work. For example, volunteering with NGOs. Um, a lot of students, they might do a service to learning when they go abroad. And so that's when they work with different NGOs, cooperatives and local organizations. And so that might be um, working with a nutrition center to help student, um, the community, people in the community gain nutrition and food while also helping students read. It may be helping build homes for people. You may even um, design a website for a certain company that you're working with. And so all those skills you gain by doing different volunteer work or just working in a classroom setting abroad, making sure you can do that, um, trans make that evident on your resume or your cover letter and speaking towards that because it might seem something like something simple or you just you might blow it off but many people don't have those experiences and talking to that is important mm -hmm. so we were also talking about how do how do we take these experiences and include them on our resume. So first of all is that they are important to include. If you're thinking, should I, should I put them on my resume or CV or not? Um, employers like to see it. So we were reading, um, there was a study a while back that um, the number was really high, about 70% of employers would be more likely to hire um, a prospective employee with um, some study abroad, travel abroad um, experience. So how important it is to include that on your, on your resume or CV and think about it in terms of those transferable skills. Um, so one that we mentioned, um, so in addition to listing the courses and relevant service learning projects you may be working on or volunteer opportunities that you had, that you can put that in the transferable skills framework um, and help an employer connect the dots, right? So um, we have some examples on our next one. Do you want to walk through this one? And so if you all have seen a resume, you will see different formats of a resume, but this is just one section. And this is a student kind of talking about their study abroad experience. And so they went to, I'm not going to say all of that, but they went to that university to study, um, <laughs> scoring the times of January 2018 and April 2018. And the university was in Chile, so they made sure they put that as well. And then one of our providers we work with is CIEE and they send students abroad and so they made sure they put all that information clear and concise so people can understand their journey and why they're talking about it and then they did they worked so they did the verb that they were talking about so that action that they did worked with local women women's textile cooperatives and then they said the name and then also they talked about built a website for the cooperatives with two media specialists and so they're talking about different things that they did. And so there you see the action that they're doing and then the responsibility that they had building that website and then who they were with. And so also enhanced my Spanish language oral communication skills. And so let's say you didn't speak any Spanish, but you went to a Spanish speaking country. You still had to enhance those skills, even if you don't feel you're not fluent. That still happened because it was learning how to work with money, learning how to communicate with different individuals. And so all of this is happening, but sometimes students have the tendency not to list that on a resume or not listing the study abroad experience. And so just doing that and making sure you're doing it in a good format where people can see it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So we also were thinking about ways that you could include it, include your study abroad experience in your cover letter. So those personal experiences of what it means to you uh, when you volunteered or when you um, completed research or when you uh, worked with a service learning project, um, those stories that are personally meaningful to you uh, will also be meaningful. You can make them meaningful to a prospective employ uh, employer. And so I'm sharing one of my examples. <laughs> <laughs> this is from an actual probably 10 or 12 year old cover letter that I found uh, from back in the day. Um, but just to read a little bit of this, my commitment to community engaged research continued at the University of Colorado. I conducted independent ethnographic research for my master's thesis and traveled to Dakar, Senegal, where I studied Muslim women, Islam, and family planning practices. This project was the realization of a dream. From conceptualizing the topic and securing grant monies through the planning, budgeting, and organizing, of day-to-day -day logistics, to finding a place to live, and finally synthesizing writing and defending the thesis, I successfully managed the project from start to finish. So you get a sense of some of the things that I had to do um, in the process of living um, in Senegal for three months. And, you know, I also shared, um, you know, some of what my day-to-day -day life was like, you know, going to Quranic school each morning with the kids. And um, I taught English class in the afternoon. And, um, you know, being able to interview and observe local midwives, that was incredible. Um, but all of those things translate into um, skills that people, um, will find helpful for their organizations. And that's the family I lived with there on the right. <laughs> and so the interview process. And if you've been through an interview process, you know, the, the questions are coming. Um, they're trying to get an example of who you are and understand how you will benefit their company or um, let's say the school if you're going to graduate school, who you are and how, what the work you've done and how that can benefit what program you're trying to get into as well. And so these steps processing and answering the question and it's called, what is it called again? Star. Star. Okay. And so situation describe, okay, so situation describe a challenge you face. Excuse me. Part of you guys' faces on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> describe a challenge you face, something similar to the example posed by the interviewer. And so I think we have an example of this and how it can be done. And so we'll wait till we get to that. And then task slash action, explain the action that you took to resolve the situation. And then results detail the positive outcomes that came from your actions. And so answering, making sure when you're answering your questions during the interview, you're adding parts of those. Okay, so here is our mock interview with a brave person. Get ready to unmute yourself, yourselves. <laughs> okay, so sort of how to think about this. We, we were thinking about common questions that we might get on an interview. And so people really love situational questions on interviews. For example, tell me about a challenge you faced and how, uh, how you met that challenge. Um, and so, so Sydney, I'm so sorry, you're our, <laughs> you're our student. Sydney, have you been abroad? I actually have not been abroad. It was a long, it was actually a, before I actually came to college, but I would, I hadn't really been abroad. Okay. Let's see, Tanya, have you been abroad? Walter, have you been abroad? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> 
I haven't studied abroad, but I've been to a couple of situations where a couple of countries, uh, I was in Puerto Rico this past August, and I was there with my wife for about 10 days. So um, I had, had some challenges there. And, yes. uh, and uh, I guess in Canada and Mexico. Mm -hmm. So all of you, and just think about how you might, and Sarah and I will work on this too. So when, you're, when you have a question like, tell me about a challenge you faced and how, how you rose to that challenge. Um, so we're going to first think about a, a situation that you may have encountered when you were abroad. Amy, you can participate as well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then explaining an, like the actions. What did you do? How did you help to resolve that situation? And then um, if there is a positive outcome, and it is kind of better if you pick an example that has a good outcome. You don't want to want to give the example where you took actions and um, the entire village caught on fire or something, you know, we'll, we'll maybe don't tell that one. Um, <laughs> but um, anybody want to take a, take a jump in and, and take a stab at a challenge that they may have faced? Dr. Hayes, I can, I can, um, Think back to one challenge, and, and I hope it fits with what you have. Uh, in 1994, I attended a um, music conference in San Diego, California, and I was um, the person that was there to talk about music theory and how you teach it in the uh, public school system. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, we went to Tijuana, Mexico, which is about, I guess, 30 minutes, maybe 20 minutes outside of San Diego. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that I think I faced was uh, after uh, one of the programs, we were, we were home. And these are people basically all over the United States and uh, in Europe. So we went to um, uh, a restaurant and they were preparing tacos for us. The problem was, is that in my, my mind, I thought that the food was going to taste like Taco Bell. Oh. And when I tasted it, it did not. No, it and did so not. And so I had to go through a <laughs> mindset to realize, okay, well, uh, this is a, a, a different aspect of, of, of thinking and it's not going to be the, the Taco Bell uh, experience. So I went ahead and, and, and ate it and was able to go on with the rest of my um, uh, evening um, in Tijuana, uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was my challenge. Uh, maybe not an educational uh, standpoint, from uh, an educational standpoint, but to me it was an educational standpoint because I was in a different country. Um, there was a, a different mindset. Um, I had taken Spanish uh, in college. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that I, I, um, I felt uh, comfortable about. But there were still things that, um, uh, that threw me, that made me feel uncomfortable, and I had to just kind of reload. Yeah, so what have we learned from this? I, I actually really like this example. Okay, so... This is one of those things when we talk about, um, has everybody heard the phrase emotional resilience? Right? So the resilience is when we have um, a, a difficult emotional experience or we have um, something that, uh, that is disappointing that didn't turn out how we wanted it to. And uh, being resilient means that you're able to bounce back from that. So in this case, here you go and sample the local cuisine and it does not taste like you were expecting it to taste. Um, and there are many pivots, right? So one could spit out the taco and say, oh, this is awful. Um, and, you know, let's leave and let's just eat when we get back to the States. And, um, 
you know, or, you know, you could have all kinds of reactions or in your case, um, it's a growth moment, right? So this doesn't taste like I thought it would taste, but let me keep an open mind. Let me see how I feel about this. Let's, let's give it a go. And, um, and then all of a sudden, an hour later, you're in love with Mexican real tacos. <laughs> and you have a good experience. You, I hope, had a good experience. Um, so I think all of us have had those, those challenges abroad, right? Um, I know, um, you know, from uh, little things like uh, not being able to think of certain words. Uh, when I went to Senegal, everybody, um, I couldn't find, people didn't speak English. So I would go weeks <laughs> uh, without being able to speak English to someone. And um, I remember, you know, it's, it's like a retraining of your brain, um, you know, to say very basic things and, and phrases um, that you have to say it in English and then you know, switch and then say whatever the phrase is in French. And, um, you know, it's slower. So you have to be patient with yourself. And, uh, but yeah, that can be frustrating. Right, Amy? <laughs> uh, sometimes, um, like in a class, if uh, the professor or the, my classmate is saying some slam, but I can get it, yeah. So I'm kind of like confused and don't know what's happening now, yeah. But I, I mean, um, everyone's very, very kind. I said, oh, so what's the meaning? And they will explain the meaning to me. So I, oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yes, my um, I one of my favorite French teachers had this fantastic phrase, and she talked about talking around something. So if you don't know what the word itself is. Uh, you start saying all the things around it. So, you know, you can't think of the word milk. So you say, comes from a cow, it's white, you put it in coffee, you know, <laughs> like until it's, oh, oh, you're trying to say milk. Um, and um, yes, I remember the first time I, it had been about a week and I finally uh, met someone who spoke English and I just unloaded. <laughs> These are all the things that I've been trying to say and I haven't been able to say, will you tell this person this and tell this and we have to, and I've been trying to explain this, will you help me? And it was just this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful release, but right, we learn in that way. We learn through those challenges. The challenges are what make us. Um, so same thing when we reflect on the second question. How has your experience working in different communities readied you for, for this position? So I love this question because those of us who have, um, have only worked in one community or in one area or one, you know, it, we all know that uh, throughout our lives, we have to be able to work with people who look like us and don't look like us and um, speak our language and don't speak our language. Like we have to have the versatility to work with different communities. So um, same question posed to the group and you guys feel free to jump in, but you know, describing a community that you worked with when you were abroad and you know, the work that you did with that community and, you know, how, uh, what it meant to you, you know, how did it, um, how did that experience working with people different from you um, help you, help, help you become who you are? Take it. It's okay. Dr. Hayes, I can, I can, uh talk about that on the reverse direction of it. On the reverse, um, okay. <laughs> yeah. One of the first jobs I had uh, my first year in teaching was um, at a high school. 
and uh, we recruited students from abroad. Mm. Uh, and yet, uh, my first two uh, students were from Japan. Uh, later had a guy from France, a uh, young lady from Romania. Mm -hmm. And um, with them coming in from a different country, I had to be extra sensitive to um, uh, their needs, uh, intellectual, of course, uh, mm -hmm. social. And it was an aid to me as a teacher because I had to, to grow uh, and not just think in a, a box of teaching uh, several students who were American citizens. Mm -hmm. I had to think about, okay, well, I know they're learning the English language and the universal language for us is music. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these kids that came from uh, Japan, Romania, uh, and France, uh, in my case, being a pianist, they already had some kind of background in music. And so I had to up my game uh, by learning uh, some French, uh, some Japanese, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think on the, uh, another aspect of it is when I was in graduate school and um, I attended Southern Illinois University, mm -hmm. my professor, I'd say 70% of the students were, uh, of Asian descent, mm -hmm. Chinese, Japanese, uh, Malaysia, etc. And so um, I had to walk into a situation and realize that, uh, well, I knew my culture, but at the same time, I had to embrace whatever they were um, trying to convey to me. There's a um, raw fish, what is that called? Sushi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or so you can sashimi. Walk in, uh, walking into my professor's piano studio, and uh, I had never eaten sushi before in my life. And there were several uh, Asian students, and they gave me a piece because it was his birthday. And mm. my mentality again was like, well, this must be something similar to hamburgers. And when I tasted <laughs> it, I was like, boom, it was a brain freeze. And um, uh, I wasn't ready to you know, to embrace it at that particular point in time. Uh, but in dealing with that circumstance and um, my first three or four years of teaching, it just enabled me to um, expand a lot of the things that you've been talking about the last 30 minutes, where I had to think out of the box uh, as to how I was going to work with the students, um, learn their culture as well, Mm -hmm. and to make sure that they were going to be comfortable and successful uh, in the goals that they had musically. I love that. Great story. It's a great story. You thought sushi was going to taste like hamburgers? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so funny. <laughs> and, and I to add on that, um, I do have a friend in Malaysia uh, and we still talk via uh, Facebook uh, now. And we were going through the same things uh, when we were uh, in graduate school. Uh, I, I would like to think that we were probably uh, two of the best, you know, pianists in our program. I think Amy plays piano also. And uh, we you, had Amy? Go... Yes. Yeah, she's a pianist. I haven't heard a piano yet, but, but um, I've heard it. And the, um, uh, the guy's name is Yu Yong Chong. Mm. And I observed him and I could tell that he was very confident uh, about a lot of things. But in our society, we look at uh, a person who is very confident as being aggressive mm. or, or too over uh, confident. Mm. And um, I perceived him as just a person who knew what he was doing, what he, what he wanted, and he didn't care how he went about it. And so for me, it changed my mentality. Um, and I didn't worry about it. Um, being at the University of Alabama, um, which still has some um, racial issues, uh, even today, uh, I had to walk into it and face some of the same issues. But I was able to just able to absorb him. Um, 
uh, observe him and follow a lot of the things that he went through and build up my confidence to a certain point where I could be as successful uh, as he was in the program. And so as a result, um, over the past 16 years, we still, you know, talk back and forth on Facebook uh, about certain issues that are happening here in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on, you, you know, in music, and uh, also what's going on in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Okay. That's great. Any other stories? Any other things that Sometimes when you hear somebody else's story, it makes you, it jogs your own memory. You want to tell one of yours. Well, I'll tell one of mine. Woohoo! I studied abroad in Guatemala and um, it was probably, it was during my junior year in college. And um, I worked with students with disabilities in a students with disabilities school specifically for students with disabilities. And you don't have a lot of those schools in the US, but um, this school was just for students with disabilities. And so working in that environment, um, I learned different languages that were spoken. Like, I don't know how to speak them, but I learned how to hear and see. And I also, I assumed lots of people would speak Spanish because I was in Guatemala, but they also had their different tribal languages that a lot of the students spoke as well. And so being in the school system there, actually assisted me when coming back to the US. And so while it was a different school system, a different framework, I also got to see actually the disputes that people would have. And so for people who may have worked with um, the city and then people who may have worked with a private company. And so how they were trying to manage those conflicts that they had while serving the students. And then coming back to the educational system in the United States, where I worked um, as an advisor, but through a different company for high schools in the United States through a different county. So I didn't work actually with that county. And the position and the different things that you have to adapt to, I learned how to deal with conflict in a calm and professional manner. But also because I had worked with people in Guatemala and learning and also learning a bit of Spanish myself when I came. This, the school that I ended up working with had a lot of students who were of Latinx um, descent. And so while it was a predominantly white school, there was also students who came in a lot from different countries that say Guatemala, Venezuela, wherever they were coming from and having a staff member who I would just say, oh, or their family will come and I will speak a little bit of Spanish and a little bit of Spanish just saying hello or just talking to the mom and dad, they would, they would feel more at ease working with me because they're like, oh, she, she doesn't, even though she doesn't know Spanish, they'll always say, oh, you try, you did well. And so just yeah. because I tried or they're, they will talk about they're from Guatemala, but oh, I've been, and they will say where you stayed. And so that rapport that that built, yeah. the parents feel more comfortable to ask for help and ask, come into the school mm -hmm. and doing that. If that experience that I had abroad wasn't there, it would have not allowed me that easier way to do parent and student interactions with a different community that I wasn't expecting. And so that was good for me. Excellent examples, excellent examples. Anybody else, Amy? Yeah, uh, I want to share my experience um, teaching Chinese in multi distance center with the children. Oh, yeah. that's so good. Yeah, that's so cute. And it's my first time to teach a, like a class of children. And I think I learned a lot um, because here is a very diverse diversity um, culture. So in a classroom, we also have like very uh, the student the background is from the diversity culture. So um, when I um, when I think in my lesson plan, and I learn I have to check my uh, lesson plan the content with the kindergarten teacher to make sure is is okay with all the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, because one time 
I uh, I'm prepared to teach your children like um um some a uh, Christmas is a Christmas and some vocabulary in Chinese, but then uh, the teacher told me some student they can they uh, they can learn uh, anything from Christmas. It's more their family didn't allow them to learn things from Christmas. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that reminds me I have to make sure my lesson plan is okay for all the students yeah, in the class, right? Yeah, being thoughtful of religious diversity, exactly. Yes, yes. Right, yeah, it makes us mindful that, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, s- similar situation with me, you know, I was a Christian American living in a predominantly Muslim country, living with a Muslim family, it makes me very mindful of of religious diversity and, you know, making sure that we're respectful of of everybody. Yes, that's why I learned, yeah. Hi, Taylor. Hey. Hi, I look a mess and I just finished an exam, but hey, everyone. (laughs) Hey. Oh, did Taylor have any? Situation? Yeah, so Taylor, you may, uh, we're putting you on the spot. <laughs> so we're talking about how your experience and your case studying abroad in Brazil, um, how you're able to take that experience and talk about it with prospective employers. So if you had a particular story or um, a story that would demonstrate, um, you know, skills, skills of adaptability or, um, you know, working cooperatively in teams or, you know, any, any story that would, you think would really resonate, we would love for you to share it. Um, well... Wow. Um, I'm still working on interviewing skills as far as like that, coming up with stories and stuff. So because I know you, (laughs) can you tell us the story about working on the house and presenting the house to the family? Um, okay. Well, when I worked for Sari Crianza in Brazil, um, I worked with their team of, it was a lawyer, social worker, um, architect, um, the vice president, constructor, construction workers, and all that on a housing project and stuff. And I dig deeper into how they develop their housing projects and build one for a family. Um, well, rebuild and add it on for a family based around the child's needs. Wow. So what did that experience, when you think about things that you hadn't done before, experienced before, something that you learned in a deep way because you were a part of that, what do you think about? Like, what do I think about, like, what I learned? Mm -hmm. Um, I grew a deeper appreciation for what you know, I have and what I see and what others have and stuff like that. I humbled myself a lot more when you go out there and you see someone that is in a worse place than you and like health wise, physically, emotionally, in society, all that. Um, You just go a deeper compassion level Mm -hmm. and it really humbles you in a deeper way Mm -hmm. 
from what I heard you say in the beginning, you said you worked with like a social worker and then also um, an architect and those different people you worked with. And so let's say you were having an interview for social work. And so just using that story and just talking about how you got the opportunity in Brazil to work with people from different um, fields and areas to build a home and also the discussions you had with them and how that um, helped you kind of decide on your field that you're wanting to go into and talking towards that also. And so even in that story that you were telling, um, using that in that a job interview that you may have in the future or for graduate school and refining mm -hmm. that. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. And talking about, um, you know, design work for um, folks with special needs um, and, you know, specifically working with a family with, with children with special needs and thoughtful design that helps um, that child be successful and safe in his own home. That's powerful. Yeah. I love it. Y'all, I know we're running out of time. Um, and, and so really we have done a lot of this. So we're, the last part we were going to talk about sharing our own stories. And I'm, I'm so grateful to this group for, for digging deep and sharing, um, sharing from your personal um, stories and memories as well. That's, that's so impactful. Hey, hey. hey. who's that? You're so annoying. It's an Isla. Nyla. <laughs> We're happy to see you. Um, so just to sum up, you know, all of these studying abroad, we get all of these fabulous transferable skills that we can then um, turn into powerful stories that will help prospective employers um, get a get a true sense of who we are um, and what we know and, and what how we operate and um, and growth areas for us um, and I think this this was such a helpful thing I think Sarah um, and I also want to remind you all about Tuesday at 11 a.m. Amy Amy had to leave she had a class Oh, okay. Well, then the sneak preview is Amy will be giving our Global Studies Happy Hour talk on Tuesday at 11. And she, if you are curious about schools in Taiwan, what was Amy's experience like going to school as a child, in high school, into college, through her master's degree, and some comparative notes um, between um, American schools and Taiwanese schools. Tune in, tune in on Tuesday at 11 for our next Global Studies Happy Hour. Uh, we are so thankful to all of you and um, wonderful to see you all and uh, be safe, be good to each other, take really good care. Um, yes, back at you.